I'm now a 27-year-old woman in Louisville, Kentucky. The story technically begins at birth when I was taken from the hospital into foster care, but it wasn't until the age of 21 that I finally got the identifying information I needed to find my birth family. If you're adopted, you know that your entire life is feeling a sense of emptiness and loneliness, just waiting for the day to see your blood for the first time. It didn't help that I grew up in an abusive, overly religious household with my adopted family. So, at 21, I found them. Finally. I got the paperwork from the Kenton County Courthouse. I was only ever told that I was half Filipina and had to be put into a Catholic household. At 18, I was told non-identifying information that I had five siblings at birth. My mother, whom we'll call Misha, loved to write and knit. My father, who we will call Lynn, was a bass fisherman who wrote love songs on his boat. So the idea in my mind was this Catholic family who just didn't have the funds for a sixth child and wanted to give them the best life. Boy, was I wrong. I first Facebook Misha and find out her last name was different. Okay, they got a divorce. I googled first and made a name and there it was. She was currently in prison for cooking meth. I focused on her first because I couldn't find my birth father anywhere at first. My mindset was, well, if she is in prison for cooking, I'm sure she's been arrested before. I'm not in the slightest a judgmental person, but merely wanted to see more photos of the woman who gave birth to me. I press enter on the Google search and this became the beginning of something that has haunted me until this day. She was on the Deviant Offender Registry for Life. I looked more into finding a court document about it. She allowed several men, including family members, to abuse all of my siblings, including the boys. I can't contain myself and feel like I'm in a nightmare. She would get off to men doing this to her children, but this is something I later learned. I finally find Lynn, also in prison. Five charges of interfamilial relations, carnal assault, and a few others. I was in shock. My entire childhood and life changed. This idea of what I always believed vanished. Now, long story short, I find my youngest sister that at first I believed was a cousin. Her number was on her Facebook. I call her and she almost immediately asks, Do you know what happened with our parents or... I tell her no, so she can speak her truth freely. My brother... A year older than me had a learning problem and Lynn took his anger out on him. He was thrown down steps and his arm broke. He was fed his own feces when his teacher told her birth parents that he had told her that he said that he was hungry and wasn't fed. My older brother was trained to beat up my younger brother for their sick enjoyment. They both were taken advantage of, but the younger one went through literal torture. The older brother was the favorite, if you can even call it that. They locked the younger brother in a room for days at a time, to starve and beat him. My siblings would feed him scraps under the door. As for my sisters, my older sister was Lynn's pet and was always in love with her. She had it worse because she would try to protect our younger siblings so they wouldn't endure it the way she did. Still to this day... She believes that she saved the youngest sister, but she doesn't have the heart to tell her she was still abused. They would be drugged, and terrible things would be done to them by anyone that would give Misha and Lynn money. They never had a steady place and sometimes only had a home of logs over a ditch to cover them from weather. They were later taken away after Lynn's brother ended his own life after finding out because... He believed that he could have saved them since Lynn had done terrible things to him as a child. He ended his own life and our aunt and uncle finally somehow found out and got them out of there. The CPS workers who had been working there for 30 plus years proclaimed that she had never seen anything like it. I also heard that when he was in the military that he had ended the life of a streetwalker by strangling her and leaving her to die. That's a whole other story. This is only scraping the surface, but I have never seen so much evil in my life. I am not religious by any means, but I can say that I was thankful to be saved from that.
My story starts back in 2016. I'm a 23 year old girl. At the time all of this took place I was 20. I was working at a cafe near my house as a cashier. I managed to make some really good friends which helped the work days go by very quickly. We would all hang out after work and drink and then go back to work the next day and repeat the process. One day I was working the morning shift with a few of my friends. I was the only cashier on the clock because my friend was on break and it was pretty slow. I was goofing off with my friend Andy when a guy around my age came up to the register. Andy knew him somehow, though I didn't think to ask how at the time. They exchanged a quick friendly catch-up and he ordered a soda that she just gave him for free. I remember thinking it was kind of odd to come into a cafe just to get a soda, but I assumed since he knew his friend worked there, he knew he could score some free stuff. Andy and I quickly resumed goofing off behind the counter and I didn't give it another thought. A few days later I got a text from a random number that said, Hey, it's Patrick. I saw you at work with my friend the other day and I thought you were really cute. I was hoping I could ask you out on a date. I assumed Andy had given the guy my number. I made a mental note to let her know that I would prefer she asked me next time but I went ahead and responded because he was a friend of hers. He wasn't the usual type I would go for, and I had just gotten out of a relationship, but I didn't want to be rude. I responded with a quick, Oh, hey, I remember. Thank you, I appreciate the compliment, but I'm not in the right place to start dating right now. I just kind of got out of a relationship. We can be friends, though, right? He said he was cool with it and started asking me questions about my last relationship. I explained that I was in a very restricting and controlling relationship. He was really supportive at first and completely took my side. After a few days of texting on and off, he continued to ask me random questions about my ex-boyfriend. And this is when things got a little bit weird because he started to sympathize with my ex, saying subtle things like, Yeah, I wouldn't want you to hang out with other guys either because they all probably like you. Or... I would probably be mad if other guys got to see you in short skirts. I chalked it up to him attempting to be cute and compliment me and I decided to just ignore it. Things seemed normal for a while and he would stop by the cafe to get a soda every once in a while. He was a little guilty of holding up the line with conversation and I would have to politely ask him to let me take the rest of the customers. About a week and a half had gone by since he had first texted me and he started to send me messages like, Are you ready to date yet? Or, do you like me enough to give me a chance? That's when I started to get really concerned because I realized he had no interest in being friends and that he was secretly hoping he could change my mind. I wasn't ready to date after a week and a half, especially not someone who sympathized with the things that I hated so much about my last relationship. I told him this and he got really upset but seemed to understand. Things began to escalate when he started showing up at the beginning of every single shift I worked. The time didn't seem to matter. If I opened, he would show up at 5am and demand I let him in the store even though the store wasn't open yet. The worst time was when he showed up at 5am with a soccer ball. I told him for the millionth time that I couldn't let him in because we weren't open yet. He began to kick the soccer ball up against the glass while I was completing my opening duties. It was extremely distracting and would startle me every time the ball hit the glass. On that particular day, we were getting a large produce shipment and he dribbled his soccer ball into the truck and was running around trying to evade the delivery drivers who were attempting to get him to go away. My manager didn't notice him standing around the door and unlocked it so that the drivers could bring their deliveries into our storage cooler. He slipped in through the door while they were in the back and began to play soccer all around the store while yelling, go on a date with me, over and over again. Thank God my manager heard the commotion and yelled at him to leave the store. As soon as the doors were open for business, though, he decided to hang around the register and say really inappropriate things when customers were trying to order. I was more annoyed than anything, that he somehow knew my schedule and I decided to confront Andy about this. When she came into work, he was sitting at a table watching me. I asked Andy to help me with something and we went into the back of the cafe. As soon as we turned the corner, I quietly yelled, Andy, why would you give that guy my schedule? She had no idea who or what I was talking about. I told her that Patrick had been coming in every day at my scheduled times 
and she swore she didn't give him my schedule or my phone number. This was when I got really freaked out because she told me they aren't even friends. The only reason she was nice to him that day was because he used to date her friend and he's a really bad guy and she was scared of him. She told me that I should completely cut off all contact and do my best to avoid him but didn't go into details of his relationship with her friend. I blocked his number right then and there and when I left for work I left out the back door so that he wouldn't see me. Later that night I got a call from a random number. I was waiting to hear back from my doctor because I had a hospital visit earlier that year and they checked some blood samples earlier that week to make sure everything was good. The area code was right so I answered it. To my horror, I heard Patrick's voice on the other end saying, Why did you block me? He sounded really angry and I didn't know what to say because I was afraid. Before I could even think of anything to say, he went off on a really angry rant. Do you think you're too good for me? No wonder your relationship didn't work out. You're just a tease. All you had to do was go on one date with me. Is that too hard for you? This is your last chance. Go on a date with me. You will regret it if you don't. Then, in a completely calm voice, he said, I'll hurt something if you don't. I sat there completely stunned. I was absolutely not going on a date with this psycho, but I was afraid of what he would say or do if I said no. I guess I remained quiet too long for his liking because he said, wrong choice, in a low voice and hung up. I was supposed to work the next day, but I get really bad anxiety that makes me feel really nauseous, so I told Andy what was going on and asked her if she would cover my shift because I was freaking out. Thank God she said yes because according to Andy, Patrick came barreling into the cafe demanding to know where I was. When Andy told him I was at home sick, he asked her where. Obviously, Andy didn't tell him where I lived and got the manager to tell him to leave and that he wasn't allowed to come back to that cafe again or they would involve the police. Andy also mentioned that as he left, he looked like he was gripping something shiny and long in his side. She only got a quick look, but believed it to be a knife. I ended up quitting my job at the cafe because I couldn't handle the anxiety of walking through those doors every day, and I absolutely don't answer unknown numbers. I don't know what I was planning to do or what would have happened if I had gone to work at all, but all I can say is Andy possibly saved me from serious injury and maybe even saved my life by taking that shift. Something was seriously wrong with Patrick and I hope I never have to hear his voice or see his face again. I'm posting this for a friend who had a terrifying experience when she was in high school. She isn't part of this thread and doesn't listen to the podcast, but has asked me to keep it anonymous, so let's call her Rachel. Rachel's parents owned a business and would often work late until 9 to 10 at night. Sometimes one of them would be off early, but oftentimes they would both be gone until after she went to bed. Rachel hated being alone at night and sometimes I'd come over after school to hang out and have dinner until I reached my curfew. Sometimes I'd stay in the guest room if I stayed out too late. Most of the time though she would just call me for peace of mind and someone to talk to. I didn't mind because we had great conversations and felt bad for her that she had to be alone and uncomfortable. One night she called me like normal and I was telling her about an upcoming wrestling match out of state. As I was mid-sentence, she said with a shaky voice, I, I, I think someone just knocked on my downstairs door. I told her not to worry because it was probably just a neighbor telling her that her outdoor or indoor cat had made its way into their yard again, which it had a habit of doing so this wasn't an uncommon case. I said for her to go downstairs and look through the peephole to make sure it was someone she knew. Rachel set the phone down to go downstairs to look. A couple of minutes went by before she picked up the phone and said, There's a creepy looking old woman outside my door, pounding on it and not saying anything else. I didn't know what to say at first. I eventually said, Oh, that's really strange. At least it's not a man or someone who could easily hurt you, I guess. 
I should add that it was winter time, and although it was only around six, it had already gotten dark. Rachel lived in a safe, upper-class neighborhood with a low crime rate. After I asked Rachel if she was going to call the police or just wait to see if the woman left, about five minutes had gone by and she said, I think she's gone, the banging stopped. We were both silent for a few minutes before Rachel said something horrifying. I noticed her voice lowered to almost a whisper as she exclaimed, Oh no, I don't remember if I locked the back door. I then told her to lock her bedroom door and call the police to be safe. Whatever the woman wanted and as harmless as she may be, you can never really know someone's full intentions. I think we can all agree that it's also strange for an elderly woman to be outside in the freezing cold darkness knocking on random people's doors. I told Rachel to stay on the phone and that I was coming over, but the police should be there before me. I put her on speakerphone in the car and asked her if she could hear anything outside. No, I, I don't hear anything, she said. See, I said, I highly doubt that a woman would break in even if you left the back or side door unlocked. A few moments went by before, through my speaker, I could hear a loud banging on what I assumed to be Rachel's door. I heard Rachel start to cry and yell out, asking who was there. Is it the police? I yelled, asking who it is. Who is that? Rachel yelled. No answer, only continued banging. I could hear Rachel crying and yelling at her door, and then the phone was silent. I sped to her house, where... Thankfully, out front I could see police lights and Rachel talking to a couple of officers. Rachel's mom arrived shortly after me, which was when I got the full story. There was a skilled nursing home nearby where Rachel lived. Apparently, one of the residents had somehow gotten out of the locked wing where she lived. She wasn't known to be violent by the employees, but was in the advanced stages of Alzheimer's and would often forget where she lived and would try to get the staff to take her back to her home with her husband. Her husband had passed years back, and Rachel's parents had bought the house new when she was born. I guess it's not a very dramatic way to end the story, and actually rather sad. However, being a young girl knowing someone is outside your room banging on the door, not saying a word, has to be terrifying. You could say I had a rough childhood growing up. Things which happened in the past still haunt me to this day. I'm 25, female, anxiety ridden due to multiple past traumas. The story takes place when I was about 13 to 14. At the time my parents had just separated. My father was fighting his illness of alcoholism. My mother, a pathological liar, cheater and unbeknownst to me and my younger sister at the time, fighting a drug addiction. As I said, childhood was not easy. When my parents were together, they always fought due to their opposing addictions. So after they separated, my dad met and fell in love with my stepmother and moved far away and lost all contact with us. A few years down the road, my mom met a man named Cowboy, and we had moved in with him in a terrible house in a new town, about an hour's drive from the rest of our family. Cowboy had his own issues with drugs and alcohol and mental issues as well. He had never been around kids, teenagers, and definitely shouldn't have been. My mom at the time had issues with men, always had to have a man in her life no matter how bad they were. There's this condition where a woman needs to be with a significant other, even if she is treated horribly. It's basically like they need to be the fixer and try and improve that person, although it sometimes ends in abuse. The house we lived in scared me. I had to sleep with the door open in order to have light shine in from the hall. Yes, I know now a fire hazard, but at the time, the only way I could sleep. My mom's and cowboy's room was across the hall from mine. My sister's in the basement of the bungalow where we were living in. Cowboy was up late one night with their bedroom door open. Very rare that it was as they would hide away from me and my sister and do God knows what in the confines of their room. It was about midnight or later on a school night, so I politely asked if he could close the door so I could try and sleep or turn down their TV. This angered him. 
He gets up in a rage, walks across the hall and slams my door, telling me to F off, mind my business and keep my door closed. I retort in opening my door up again and explain I'm scared of my door being closed. Again, this time he slams the door in my face, breaking my nose. As blood of course is running down my face, my mom takes one look at me and screams at him to get out of this house now, look what you did to her nose. My sister, mom, and myself rush to the hospital to get my nose checked out, then drive to my family's house an hour away for the night. Me and my sister get pulled out of school we were in, not knowing what was going on in our house as we're now staying at my grandmother's house. We find out we're going to live with my grandparents as my mom packs up our stuff, worried for our safety. One day my mom comes to my grandparents after work and tells us to get into her car, in hysterics. My grandma sees us out of the kitchen window and ushers us to our friend's house next door. Scared watching in our friend's house at the exchange going on outside with my mom and my grandma, my mom races off, never to be seen again for a few months. At the time it was confusing the way my mom was acting, and what had happened between her and my grandma to make her leave us for months with no contact. These questions would not be answered until I turned 18. My mom was packing up her belongings from our old house, upset and depressed that she had made her boyfriend leave her because of him breaking my nose. So, she shot up drugs, takes our two dogs at the time and dumps them off the side of the road. We had been told she took them to a shelter. She's driving around under the influence without shoes or her glasses and she's blind as a bat. She thinks to herself, seeing it's her kid's fault this man had left her, she should pick up her kids and drive into a pole and end us all. But on the road, she calls my grandma and tells her goodbye. She's about to die. So as she pulls up to take me and my sister, my grandma races out knowing her plan and tells me and my sister to go and hang out with our friends next door as she had already informed their mother of her plans. Grandma talks my mom down enough for her to drive to the hospital and admit herself. She then goes on to get help for her drug abuse. She's clean now, and a very loving mother and grandmother. I'm so thankful for my wonderful grandma for jumping into action so fast before we got into my mom's car, and God knows what could have happened to us. Sometimes people need to work through things to get better. I'm a volunteer firefighter in a very small town in West Virginia and have been for just over three years being 16, male, when I joined and 20 now. Our station was built in 1974 and since then we had had eight deaths of members of the department, two since I had been there. We lost two great men in March of 2018 on the line of duty in a fire truck wreck. In the fire truck that was wrecked there are two seats in the front and between them is the motor of the truck. Directly behind the front seats are two more seats that face out of the back of the truck on either side of the motor. There are also two seats in the middle rear of the cab that face out of the front. Our chief at the time, retired now, was driving the truck that day in March. Assistant chief, deceased, was in the hot seat, passenger. Lieutenant, deceased, was in the officer seat, rear-facing seat on passenger side. Chief Engineer was in the rear-facing seat on the driver's side and one of our younger firefighters, 17, was in the middle seat facing out the front. Anyone who has knowledge of the fire service or fire trucks will know that this type of engine is called a custom. Our assistant chief and lieutenant that were on the passenger side of the truck were both killed in the fire truck when it went off the road and hit a rock outcrop on the side of a mountain. They were killed instantly. Everyone else survived with two serious life-threatening injuries and the other with a broken arm. I told you that to tell you this. This is not my story, but my former fire chief who was driving the truck that day. One day, chief was asleep on the couch in our station when he was awoken by a former chief telling him to wake up because we had a call. Chief awoke and saw no one around. There was no radio traffic and the siren on the building was silent. 
Thinking it was a dream, he went back to sleep. After around 30 seconds, he was awoken to our station tones going off and the dispatcher coming across the radio saying that our station had a structure fire. The weirdest part about this is that the former chief that woke him up had died in 1996. The story took place in 2007. Now knowing that the station is haunted, not by bad spirits, but spirits of our fallen brothers, I get a lot of comfort knowing that when I go on calls, they are watching over us all. We even leave a spot open for them on the trucks when we roll out. Being a small volunteer station, we don't have a large membership. Remember, we don't get paid for this, and we all have our other full-time jobs. So now onto my story on the night of Halloween 2019. Me and one of our probationary members were at the fire station upstairs in our pool room. We were sitting at the pool table and I was helping him study to take his Mod 1 test the next evening. We were the only people in the building at the time this night. While studying, the nighttime officer in town texted us and asked us to come down and let him in to get a snack from the vending machine. We both went down and while we were talking to him, there was a break in the conversation where the building was silent, except something broke through the silence. When we came downstairs, we had all left all the pool balls in the pockets of the table and the cover on the table. From downstairs, we started hearing the pool balls clacking against each other as if someone had started a game of pool. But we were the only people in the building, and there was no other way for anyone to get in other than the door we were standing in front of. When we walked back upstairs, officer with us, we searched everywhere in the upper level of the building to find nothing. Nothing but the cover of the pool table on the floor and the balls scattered across the table as if someone had started a game, even though no one had touched it. I know it was one of the guys who hang around the station in the afterlife, but it's still just a little eerie knowing that they are there and can play pranks on us to intentionally scare us, not to get us to leave, just to mess with us. It was their thing when they were alive. I guess I should also clarify in my experience at the station that I think it was the two guys that died in the crash I mentioned earlier. They were both very big pranksters. It was the spring of 2016. I was 17 years old and let's just say I was a very rebellious teenager. I started getting tattoos behind my parents' back in someone's basement. Stupid, I know. Well, I was getting two pieces done with my tattoo artist. He invited some of his friends over while working on my leg piece. The piece on my leg required me to pull up my shorts. One of his friends, we'll call him Tyler, started hitting on me and I tried my best to be short and see if he would get the message that I wasn't in the mood to talk. My artist finished my two tattoos and I was outside smoking a cigarette. Tyler came up to me and started asking me questions like, Do you have a boyfriend? And, can I get your number? While well, I'm going to admit he was very attractive and I had given him my number, I did eventually meet up with Tyler that night and he asked me about my age. I told him I was 17 and he grew quiet. The pause was red flags, but of course I was young and ignorant. Tyler then proceeded to tell me he was 31 and that my age didn't really bother him. At this time, I was too young and reckless to care that this dude was twice my age. Fast forward four months later and we began dating. Everything went well until one day Tyler got really high and started accusing me of cheating and got in my face and started screaming. I was shaking and didn't know how to reply to his accusations that were false. I had never given him a reason not to trust me, but of course I ignored the red flags. Another two months had passed and Tyler started to get obsessive and he would start driving by my house and asking me where I was at and why I wasn't home. This freaked me out and I had went off on him calling him a creep. Within that same week Tyler started befriending my neighbors and would watch my house from their porches and I had no clue he was doing this until one day he texted me, I see you and where are you going? I freaked out because I couldn't see his jeep anywhere and I had texted him and asked him where he was and he told me to turn around and look up. There he was sitting next to my neighbor waving at me. This made me mad and I stormed inside calling him and going off. 
Our relationship only got worse, and I was so stupid not to leave him. Tyler used to purposely drug me to steal money off me, and he still drove by my house. He would start calling me names and still even accuse me of cheating, and then it pushed him to putting his hands on me. It was September by then, and I was so terrified to leave. That same month... Tyler wanted me to go to this festival and I agreed because it would make me feel easy if people were around and he wouldn't be so abusive. Boy was I wrong. The first night we went, Tyler got so drunk he started putting his anger towards me for no reason at all. I wasn't about to argue with him and I walked away and got into his truck to ease my mind. Then all of a sudden I felt the door open and two big hands wrap around my arm and I was slammed up against the truck and it was Tyler with hatred and fury written all over his face. He smacked me and dragged me into the tent and locked the outside of it so I couldn't get out. At this time I was panicking and I was screaming to be let out. No one could hear me over the loud music and it was quite dark. I started crying and I begged and pleaded to be let out. Tyler then came in and started to caress my face and told me how sorry he was. That was his go-to move to calm me down and make up for what he did. That same year, Tyler did the unthinkable. I found out he was a married man of ten years to the mother of his children. He lied and told me he was divorced and lived with his grandparents and I had been to their house multiple times which I had believed. His wife called me and asked me questions and I felt she deserved to know. I told her everything and she told me she was going to court to gain complete custody of the kids and let him have no access to them. Tyler was so angry and furious by this and he threatened to shoot up my job. He threatened to end my own life and himself. That day after work I went to the police and filed out a report, blocked him from everything and Tyler never made an attempt to contact me again. If you're seeing this, be aware of who you let into your life and run away from people who give off red flags from the beginning. I was just a kid of about 15 or 16 when this happened. This was in the days when just about every kid in school or around the neighborhood had some type of part-time job. It was just a given that once you were old enough to push a lawnmower, shovel a driveway, or rake leaves, you spent a portion of your day working for your own money. As this was decades before the invention of the internet, having a job was something kids just accepted and some jumped into with relish. It was a great excuse to get out of the house and make a little pocket money in the process. My first part-time job was typical for that era. I had a newspaper route. That will tell you how long ago it was. I'm in my late 40s now, but can still remember riding my bicycle to the corner to collect the bundle of papers that had been dropped there, counting them out to make sure I hadn't been shorted, insert whatever flyer or ads were included for that day, and pedaling door to door for blocks to deliver them. Right here I can tell you that all that old movie stuff you see of the kid on his bike zipping merrily down the street, chucking newspapers blindly in the directions of homes as he passes is complete nonsense. If a kid back then went meandering around the neighborhood flinging newspapers from his bag all willy-nilly, he'd get fired in a hurry. It was kind of a big deal to be a good paper boy. You knew not to ride on the grass, let your bike drop onto anyone's bushes after hopping off, and to keep clear of the flower beds. This was the suburbs, where practically everyone obsessed over how nice their yard looked. So the better you treated your customers, and their yards, the better the tips were when you collected the money each month, and some even bigger ones come Christmas. They even had trophies for the best paper boy in the county. I even won a trophy once. The thing was two feet tall, made of fake gold and marble with a figurine of a paper boy on top, delivering bag and all, holding a rolled newspaper race to the sky. This stuff was taken seriously. Monday to Friday, the papers were delivered in the afternoon. Saturday and Sunday were the only days back then that the newspaper was delivered in the morning. When I figured out that the bundles were usually dropped as early as 5 a.m., that's when I get to start my route. It wasn't that I was gunning for another trophy. It's just that if you got up that early, it'd still be dark by the time you came home. 
then you could just crash back into bed and wake up at your leisure to a free Saturday or Sunday, as if you've never had to get up in the first place. Paperboy logic. This took place on a Sunday. The Sunday papers sucked to the extent that they were the thickest and required the most inserts, including the comic section, which we still called the funnies. So I often had to take true trips, leaving half of my bundle by the street post on the corner to deliver the first part for the route, and then go back for the rest. It could be a huge pain, but it was better than getting a hernia dragging a two-ton newspaper bag along behind you. The first half of my route was almost entirely apartments. This made for quick deliveries. I could zip into these small two-story apartment buildings, set the paper down in front of each door and zip right back out. Eight deliveries in less than a minute. The second half of my route had houses spread out and around the then sparsely developed area. Right in the middle of my route was what was called the horseshoe. It was a dirt road that formed a U-shape, with the upper prongs connecting to the main road. You go down the horseshoe on one side to curve around and go up the other side when on my route. There was only five houses spread along the horseshoe with large gaps between them. There was maybe one or two streetlights along the way, mostly obscured by the branches of overhanging trees. So it was usually pretty dark. If you didn't know the way by heart, you'd be riding into a grove of trees or roll right into a ditch. That was the main reason that I loved nights with a full moon. The light of the moon shone down on the houses along this dirt road, making it easier to see. Sometimes it wouldn't even seem like it was still nighttime if the moon was really bright and there wasn't any cloud cover. In the winter, with all the fresh snow everywhere, a full moon meant a very well-lit route. What follows is the one time I wasn't all that crazy about there being a full moon. Dead center of the horseshoe's curve was a single house perched on a small hill. It was a nice two-story job with flowers running the length of the porch, a bench swing at one end near the front door, a two-car garage, the works, ideal suburbia. The only thing about this house was that it had the steepest driveway in the neighborhood, so getting up the darn thing was a chore even if you had good momentum on your bike starting out. Once to the top of Mountain Driveway, I'd just roll up the paper, slide it into the mail slot in the side door by the garage, give it a quick tap to send it inside, and then turn around and enjoy a fast glide down the driveway at top speed even without pedaling. It didn't go quite like that this time. As there was a full moon that night, it was pretty bright, even for five in the morning. Lots of houses were painted white or light colors, so they reflected the moonlight well. There was also no wind, which was a huge plus. No worry about the wind yanking the paper out of your hand before you could get it rolled up, and no fight against the wind either going through the route or coming home. When I rounded the curve at the end of the horseshoe, I was making good time. Even with the Sunday supplement doing its best to weigh me down, I'd already delivered the first half of the route and was looking forward to finishing quick so I could return home to bed. I pedaled up the steep driveway, only having to stop once to push myself along with my sneakers. I dropped the kickstand and dismounted, already digging into my bag for a paper. At the top of the driveway, the whole front of the house practically glowed in the moonlight. Bright white paint, red shutters, all those flowers... It looked kind of pretty. That's when I heard the creak. I stopped, not certain what I heard. It was definitely metal, like the hinges on a gate being opened. But there were no gates nearby that I heard of, and none of the houses on the horseshoe had fenced in yards. Then I heard the creak again, which rose and pitched to a squeak. This time I recognized the sound immediately. It was the sound of a swing, moving. I had been to every playground in town growing up, so I knew the sound that chains make when you used a swing. There was a kid's playground not far from where I was, but I doubted I could hear one of the swings from that distance. Besides, a quick glance confirmed that the playground was deserted, as it would be at five in the morning. The moonlight made that view clear. Then I heard the squeak again, lasting a bit longer. The hair stood up on the back of my neck as I realized that the sound was close. I looked back to the house and saw the bench swing at the end of the porch, suspended from two chains. It was rocking back and forth, and there was no wind to push it, and there would have to be quite a gust to budge something that heavy anyway. 
Then the swing picked up speed as if someone on it was pumping their legs to get it going. My heart started pounding like crazy. There was nobody on the swing. Not a soul. It was empty and there was no place to hide beneath it where someone could reach up to push it as a prank. The swing was just swinging back and forth on its own. I was completely terrified but couldn't look away. What was I seeing? There in the light of the full moon an empty bench swing was rocking higher and higher back and forth with nobody sitting in it. That's when I heard it. A giggle. I heard the giggle of a little girl, perhaps four or five years old at the oldest. My jaw dropped open and I was physically shaking. Let me emphasize that there was nothing sinister about this giggle at all. This wasn't a menacing laugh or a piercing cackle. This was the mischievous, tittering giggle of a very young girl at play. It was coming right from the empty bench swing. I couldn't breathe. I had never felt so frightened in my life. Anybody else at that point would have just run, or ridden away pedaling as fast as he could go, but no. I was a good paper boy and I had the trophy to prove it, acting solely on reflex, for want of another way to explain it. I yanked one of the bulky Sunday papers from my bag and fumbled with it trying desperately to roll it. I needed to get rid of that thing fast so I could get out of there. The dead air just above the swing let out what sounded like a short chuckle, as if whatever was laughing had tried to cover its mouth. The swing kept swinging. I was gibbering like some kind of lunatic as I fought with the paper. Fold, fold, why would you fold over? I eventually turned with half-rolled newspaper to push it through the mail slot. It wouldn't fit, it was way too thick. Why did the Sunday papers have to be so huge? I pushed, pulled back, pushed again, doing little more than shredding the front page with failed attempt after failed attempt. Frantically, I kept glancing back at the swing to see if anyone was there, but there was no one, just the empty swing still rocking steadily. I gave up and just rammed the stupid paper into the slot as hard as I could, squashed into a rumpled mess, half in and half out of the slot. I abandoned the newspaper and scrambled for my bike. I couldn't even get on it. I was shaking so badly and freaking out so much that it was like I had forgotten how to ride a bike. I ran down that steep driveway, dragging the bike behind me with one of the handlebars. Once I reached the dirt road, I finally was able to get onto my bike, but it felt like something had grabbed it, holding it back. I looked down to see the kickstand was still down, digging a thin rut into the dirt beside me. I smashed the thing back with my heel and pedaled for all I was worth. There wasn't another sound of giggling, but the swing rocked a little higher, as if my terror was providing great amusement for whatever sat there. I could still hear the chains on the swing squeak as I took off. At the next house, I didn't give a tinker's care about paperboy delivery protocol. I just chucked the fat Sunday edition at the door by their garage and was already zooming off before the thing hit the ground. Same for the next house and the next one, just like in the movies, right? I think by the time I completed my route that morning, I may have gone back to delivering the newspapers properly. I don't remember now. I didn't remember then. All I could remember was that empty bench swing, that disembodied giggle. When I got home... I did fall back into bed, but I didn't go to sleep. I just stared at the ceiling and felt terrified until the sun came up. The following week, it was business as usual. Afternoon deliveries, same as normal, and come the weekend, I made sure that there were fresh batteries in my Walkman so that I could drown out any unearthly giggling with the songs of Kenny Loggins and Michael Jackson. I never did hear the giggle again, not that I wanted to. The swing only ever rocked when a person was in it or when we were in the midst of a January blizzard. Even then, it only moved a little under the pounding wind. Like I said, it was heavy. Nothing else creepy or unusual ever happened on my paper route again. Even with what had happened, I realized it could have been worse. I mean, that giggling wasn't followed by any sudden footsteps as an invisible ghost child leapt off the swing to come running after me. 
That would have made for one heck of a story, but most likely one that ended with me suffering heart failure or winding up in a mental institution. To this day, I have no explanation for that giggle. Some say I was being pranked. Others tell me it was a spirit or a sprite of some kind. All I can tell you is I know what it's like to be scared by a prank or unnerved by a ghost story. Later in life, I even had a panic attack a few times, so I know what it's like to feel scared. But nothing, ever, has left me as scared as I was that Sunday morning under the full moon when I heard that giggle. For context, I'm a female that attends a Northern California community college. It's an overall great college, but the downside to this campus is the location. The layout of this building in particular has four floors total and also has stairs that point directly to the street and to the other parts of the campus. Let's just say our city ranks number eight in ten murder capitals of California. Crimes are the norm here, and with that included, we have your average creeps. Since I work 40 hours a week, I end up taking night classes because of how well they fit my work schedule. Recently at our campus, we had a homeless man expose himself to one of my classmates after class. Evidently was caught due to the security footage and obviously that wasn't a smart move. We also had another unrelated incident where a man was hanging around the woman's restroom and evidently was caught as well. Since this specific incident has occurred, I've been checking my emails for updates on this recent incident that happened on our campus, but no luck. As I was exiting out my chemistry class, feeling dazed after taking our third exam of the semester, I called my boyfriend because we planned after class to get groceries. I usually take the stairs that are directly near the street because it's a quicker way to get to the parking lot. My boyfriend mentions that we should meet up at a Walmart store and I agreed. As I was going to hang up the phone, I noticed a lone man on the first floor with his bike just standing there. I did a double take to see if he was waiting for anyone in particular but was just standing there with no expression. My boyfriend mentioned that he'll be at the store in 10 minutes and suddenly I hear the man laugh maniacally. It is strange resemblance to the Joker like the recent Joaquin Phoenix movie and thoroughly sent chills down my spine. Uh, stay on the line please, don't hang up. There's a man on the first floor laughing at what seems to be nothing. Oh god, it's so creepy. He's just standing there. Oh, uh, okay. I can hear it too. I'll stay on the phone. I head across the building to head to the other stair exit, and as I'm doing so, I still hear the man laughing. My boyfriend told me it's wise to find another classmate or a student so I'll be able to buddy up, but due to having an afternoon class, most students have already returned home. As I'm heading downstairs, and out of the corner of my eye, I can see the man is now heading to my direction, and I bolt back up. Forget that, and head back to my classroom, and report it to my professor, which then reported it to campus police. So far, no email has been sent back to me about the incident, but ever since this happened, I can still hear the man's mortifying laugh. I'd like to start this off by saying I'm a 19 year old girl about 5'5", weighing 110 pounds. To many people I'm considered tiny and approachable. To give a little backstory, I've worked at a pharmacy for the last year and a half, mainly doing grunt work, i.e. garbage runs, filing, making boxes and the like, along with my normal prescription filling duties. My office is located in a sketchy part of downtown in a major city. It is on the third floor of a four-story building that faces a busy road in the front and an older rundown residential area to the back where the garbage bins are fenced in next to the underground parking entrance. Directly across the alley that the bins are in is a worn-down yellow house that rarely sees the light through the overgrown trees and vegetation in the yard behind the gate. I would never seen anyone in or around that house during my daily garbage runs though I did notice two very large cane corso dogs that were caged on the rickety deck. I kept getting that feeling of being watched during one of my more recent trips to the bins, 
and I hesitantly glanced towards the creepy yellow house to find nothing out of the ordinary. Now I'm an avid horror fan, used to being a little bit spooked by cliches like creepy houses and spend my days being paranoid over everyday circumstances, constantly looking behind my shoulder and being suspicious of everyone that moves around me, so I chalked it up to me being paranoid. The feeling never subsided, so as I rushed to finish the job, I took one last peek behind me and saw a very tall, slender man with unkempt shaggy grey hair wearing a tattered white tank top with holes and stains, peering out the bay window over the deck and straight at me. At this point I had never known someone that lived there as I had never seen anyone, and my customer service instinct kicked in and I gave him the best polite smile I could form. He did not return it and continued to burn his eyes into my being, and after what seemed like hours, he slowly retreated back out of sight, never breaking eye contact. This was just my first encounter with this man, but by God do I wish it was my only one. The next few times were normal, with me glancing every now and then to see nothing but the pitch black inside the house and a few birds fluttering around his yard, until the day that has burned into my brain forever. It was a hot and sunny Tuesday, and I had worn a navy dress to keep me cool during the day. The time comes for me to do my garbage trip and... I grabbed my X-Acto knife, used to break down cardboard, and slipped into my dress pocket. Pulling my small cart of cardboard and garbage around the fence and into the partially enclosed area of bins, I look across the alleyway and see the man standing on his deck. He walks over to the cages and lets the dogs out, and they sprint down the stairs of the deck and up to the chain-link fence surrounding the yard and begin barking ferociously in my direction. After getting refocused on my job at hand, I periodically peered over my shoulder and out of the corner of my eye to keep tabs on this man, until the last time I did so when I could no longer see him standing on his deck, but rather he was slinking along the sidewalk outside of his fence in the shadows of the trees from his yard. He paced back and forth about thirty feet in each direction before spinning back around to go the other way. I began panicking and rushing catapulting the cardboard into the bin, and that's when I heard the sound. Rocks from the gravel alley being scuffled under heavy footsteps. I mustered up all the courage I could and turned my entire body to face the man, my hand in my pocket gripping the knife tightly, ready to defend myself. To my horror, the man was less than ten feet in front of me, head down staring at the ground with one hand behind his back, the other in his pocket. As he closed the gap between us, I heard a voice from behind me to my left. I turned to investigate the voice, and it was a young man, a tall, gawky man, probably around 23 or 4, that I recognized from the cafe on the first floor with a garbage bag in his hand. He asked me, Is that your cart? I glanced towards the cart, and dumbfounded, I responded with, Yes. He struck up a conversation with me and came close and rested his hand on my shoulder and looked me in the eyes and whispered, come with me. He grabbed my cart and began walking towards the building. This is when I turned back to look at the man who had scurried back across the alleyway to his fence, scrambling to open the latch while shoving something into his pocket and cursing under his breath, shooting daggers at the cafe man. When we made it back into the parking lot adjacent to our building, he stopped and he said, I was on my way to the bins when I noticed the man coming toward you. I hoped asking you about your cart and being near you would deter him from whatever he was thinking of doing. Now you be safe and bring a partner every time you're down here or you can come grab me if no one else can. We said our goodbyes and I thanked him profusely. I never went down alone again after telling my coworkers what had happened. To the young men in the cafe at the time, your small talk seemed meaningless and forced but it very well could have been the reason I'm still alive to thank you for being my hero and saving me from a possible life-threatening attack. I am forever grateful. So this happened about two years ago when I was 20. I'm quite a small female. I was doing some shopping in town, alone. I still remember that it was a warm Sunday afternoon, 
People were out with families and it was quite busy in the city center. I had some free time so I decided on paying my grandma a visit. To get to her place you need to take a 20 minute bus ride from where I was. I was waiting for my bus and I noticed this man staring at me. He wasn't much older than I was and I still remember he had on a bright yellow hat. I usually don't really care when someone looks at me but this man was staring at me with a sort of anger. Like I had done something to him. Most people in the bus stop were either facing the traffic or looking at the coming buses, but not him. He had his back to the traffic and was just staring at me. I had a weird feeling about him, but I saw my bus coming and just hoped he wouldn't get on it. Except he did. I quickly sat in the window seat and luckily for me, this old lady sat next to me. This old lady was like a shield between me and the sky. He stood next to our seat almost the whole ride except for pacing around oddly a couple of times. I was already quite freaked out and was texting my at the time boyfriend throughout it. While he hadn't actually done anything to me, I just had a really bad gut feeling. A few stops before mine, the old lady sadly got off the bus. The guy's behavior became even weirder. He sat next to me which made me completely tense up. I refused to even look at my phone or text anyone in case he saw something he could use to look me up later. I think he sensed me tensing up, so we got up and went back to either standing next to my seat or pacing around the bus. My stop came and I waited until the last moment to get off the bus. Sadly, he also managed to get off the bus. What followed confirmed that he was indeed after me. I guess in an attempt to put me off again... He ran ahead of me on the road and kept glancing back. Him doing so actually gave me the only out from the situation. You see, if he would have kept walking behind me, I would have been forced to A. Either make a run for the apartment door and hope I was fast enough to close the door before him, or B. Run in another direction and just hope I would have reached any place safe before him. I was out of the city center now and there weren't many people around either to help me. So in that split moment, I decided to turn around, walk in the other direction, and dial my mom. It's pretty bad, but I decided to call my mom in case anything happens to me, so she would know who it was. I told my mom what happened, and she told me to make a run for it. Down the road, there was this small burger place that would have a security guard. She told me to run for it and just tell them what was going on, so I did. I glanced back and saw the guy running after me which almost made me cry. Luckily, I reached the burger place before he caught me. From the window, I saw him crossing the road. I guess him seeing me get into the burger place threw him off. I have no idea why he was so fixated on me or what his plans were if he caught me. I'm not even sure. I want to know. Hey guys, thanks for listening. I just first want to give a shout out to... Maltopia. Maltopia is a multimedia dark fiction company started about five years ago by three longtime friends. All of their stories, artwork, and narrations are original works that take place in the literary world of Maltopia. And their first book, The Red Sun by Mark Anzalone, was just published by Wild Blue Press. In addition to their podcasts and YouTube narrations, they're also working on a novel trilogy, two collections of short stories a graphic novel, and a tabletop game. Find out more at maltopia.com and stick around to hear a sample. Do you love horror stories or weird fiction? Enter Maltopia, a new world of horror fiction. Maltopia is a YouTube channel audio series that features horror, dark fiction stories, and series that take place in the same strange universe. Listen to the Shepherd of Wolves series, where a killer who uses the bones of his murdered family as weapons is lured into a dark and mysterious game. Discover the Lost Journals and Tomes series, which delves into the many events and people of Maltopia through first-person accounts. Or check out Maltopia Tales, gripping stories that explore the macabre nature of this bizarre and haunted world. All series and stories intersect and influence each other, providing horror lovers an immersive experience. Just go to YouTube and search for Maltopia, M-A-E-L-T-O-P-I-A, a new world of horror fiction. 
or just click the link to our channel in the show notes below. So come visit us and join the darkness.